Hey, I want to welcome everybody in Claremont. I'm hanging out with White River Junction. Can we give it up for our family? Uh, everybody online, we love you. We're thankful for you. And uh, it's a really uh, a big day. It's baptism weekend at Riverbank Church. And um, uh, in, in White River and Claremont, we are going to be seeing a bunch of people go public with their faith. It's such an exciting thing when we see that. And so I love baptism weekend. And, you know, I got to celebrate something else too. Our Riverbank kids' environments. If you didn't know this, um, if you're a parent of uh, children here at Riverbank, you have an environment where children are served. And unbelievable in Claremont White River. In the last few weeks, we've had record breaking numbers. Isn't that cool? Yeah. It's awesome. And so, with that said, I love that and we celebrate that, but it also means we are desperate for you to serve in there. So one of the best ways you can celebrate Riverbank Kids is by serving in Riverbank Kids. So if you're a parent of children that are being uh, served in Riverbank Kids, matter of fact, I, th- I want to say four or five or six kids in the last couple of weeks have given their lives to Jesus in Riverbank Kids. Yeah. And... There's no more practical way for you to serve in the rescue mission here at Riverbank than serving Riverbank kids. So I'm not just, I'm not in like beg mode. I'm just saying, is this your church home? You need to serve there if you're not. Okay, if you're not serving there, you need to serve there. It'll change your life. Um, And some of you are like, it scares me to death. Good. (laughs) Go serve there, right? Hey, we're going to be in Galatians today. If you have your Bibles, you might want to turn there. We'll be in Galatians chapter 4 and 5. Um, I have with me chains, heavy-duty chains, right? Um, I mean, I, there's nothing, I mean, that right there will scare you in the middle of the night, wouldn't it? Dropping chains, uh, these are real heavy-duty. Um, and, and what these represent are something we're going to talk about today. Uh, many of us, and I, I, I want to be real clear, I'm speaking specifically and clearly right now to Christians, people who say, I follow Jesus And many Christians are walking around with chains around them, binding them up, enslaved to them, and them to the chains. And unfortunately, many Christians um, don't live in freedom. Uh, Let me clarify something. When you gave your life to Jesus, you were set free, you were made free, But there's a difference between living in freedom. And I believe there are many Christians who aren't living in freedom. You have hell, you have have fire insurance, meaning, uh, hey, when I die, I'm gonna go to heaven. And and you have like, you know, this truth of being in the family of God. That's beautiful. You've been made free, but you're not living in freedom. You're still enslaved and chained to some things. And I wanna talk about that today. I wanna talk about the chains that can keep us from living in freedom, the chains that many of us have allowed to ensnare us for years. We've allowed them just to stay there. And and the truth is, is you'll never, ever live in the freedom that God wants for you. you. You may have been set free from the consequence of sin, and, and you have the promise of rescue, but you're not living in freedom. I want to share with you a few of the chains that I've identified. It's, we're going to start in Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4 in verses 8 and 9. A little background here. Paul, the apostle, is writing to Christians. Okay, He's writing to Christians, followers of Jesus, who are navigating through this very idea of what we're speaking about. It says in verse 8, Paul, writing to the Galatians, which, by the way, is a, a city. Galatia is a city in the, in the Mediterranean that Paul had helped start a church in, like Riverbank Church, a church plant. And a few years after the church started, Paul calls them out on the fact that they've allowed some chains to restrict them and enslave them from living in freedom. And here's what he says. Before you Gentiles knew God, so a little background there, Uh, The church in Galatia was made up of people who have a Jewish background and people who don't have a Jewish background, and those would be Gentiles, okay? And so he's speaking specifically to to those who don't have a Jewish background, the Gentiles. He says, before you Gentiles knew God, you were what? You were what? You were slaves to so-called gods that do not even exist. 
Paul's like, before you met Jesus, before you were set free and you were forgiven of your sins, you, you had idols in your life. No different than us, right? In this room, we, we have had idols in our lives. Many of us, the idol of, of sex, the idol of relationship. I need somebody to fill a void. The, 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 the idol of uh, substance, of alcohol and, and drugs and the, the idol of, of materialism, right? We, we, of, of entertainment. We all have come from that. And Paul is addressing, he says, before you Gentiles knew God, you were slaves to so-called gods that do not even exist. So now that you know God, or should I say now that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and what? Become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of this world. Paul right here is calling out the church, the Christians, for going backwards and, and, and just living enslaved to things that are nonsense. And I love that Paul's so clear about this. And this applies to you and me today. I want to identify some chains that have enslaved and ensnared you and me. Maybe you walked in here today with these chains wrapped around you, bound you up. You're enslaved. You, you're just slodging around in your life. The first chain that I want to identify, the first chain is the chain of selfishness. The chains of selfishness. You're, you're just ens enslaved to yourself. Now, this is very common in the world we live in because why? We wake up every day and have to take care of ourselves. We have to feed ourselves. We, we are all about ourselves. And if you don't take care of yourself, you're in trouble, right? And, and what happens is you and me, we can easily become enslaved to ourselves. We become selfish. We're too focused on ourselves. It, it's like the Galatians, for them, uh, what Paul is calling out is a they were so enslaved to self-righteousness that it, like, they, were, they were useless when it came to following Jesus. They, weren't, they were enslaved to religion. And maybe you're here today and that's you. You're enslaved. To, you're just kind of a really religious zealot. And, and that happens in church, right? If you become a follower of Jesus for a long enough time, you can become a jerk, <laughs> right? And... And there are some people who are religious jerks. You're selfish. But maybe your selfishness isn't in, rooted in your religion. Maybe your selfishness is rooted in just you. Oh, and look, one of the places that many of us uh, tend to gravitate towards with selfishness is in relationships. We, we want to make sure our needs are met first, Right? I want to take care of me first, and if you fulfill that and you take care of me, then I'll take care of you. That's selfishness, and you're enslaved, you're living in chains, and you wonder why your marriage is always up and down and suffering. It's a slave. You're a slave to self, selfishness, the chains of selfishness. Maybe uh, for you, it's, it's not a relationship. Maybe you're just so consumed with pleasing yourself by making money or getting stuff or stimulating yourself in various forms. That's selfishness and you're enslaved to it. Those are chains. And I promise you, you're not living in freedom. You, you might know Jesus. You might have fire insurance, but you're not living in freedom. And we're going to get to that in just a few minutes, what living in freedom is like and how you get there. But the truth is, is there are a lot of people who are enslaved to the chains of selfishness. As a, a matter of fact, the Bible addresses this. James chapter 3 says, but if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, for wherever there is jealousy and what? selfish ambition, there you will find, I want you to say these words with me, disorder and what? Evil of every kind. He says it right here. James, the author, the brother of Jesus, is writing to Christians and he says, that selfish ambition, that those chains of selfishness have a serious root uh, and they also have a problem and a result and that result would be disorder. The word disorder means instability. It means confusion. If you're bound and enslaved to the chains of selfishness, the Bible says that there's disorder in your life. 
And maybe you're like, gosh, you're like reading my mail, man. I'm a hot mess. Disorder. It, it, that is like a word to describe me. I, I'm, in, I'm, I'm not stable. I'm all over the place. I'm unpredictable. Uh, there's so much confusion in my life. That's the chains of selfishness. And you are not living in freedom. You're enslaved to yourself. He says, uh, James says it's you find disorder and you find evil of every kind. When you hear the word evil, you always go to the, the devil, right? And you get a little like, you think, well, that'd never be me. Well, let me explain what the word evil means here in the original language. The word evil means you're mean. There's meanness, there's worthlessness, you're investing in worthlessness. There's a sense of just like, ah, uh, whatever. That's evil. Matter of fact, if you go to the root of evil in the Garden of Eden, when, uh, when Satan came and tempted Adam and Eve, the ultimate evil one, he said, hey, if you just eat of this and you rebel against God, you're selfish, he said, you'll be able to do whatever you want. That's evil. We live in a world that says, I'll do whatever I want to do, right? Hey, I should be able to do whatever I want to do. That's not freedom, my friends. That's slavery. That's slavery. And so maybe you are enslaved to the chains of self. And the truth is, is surrender is the only way those chains can be unshackled. And the only way that these chains can be removed is by surrender. We'll get to that in a few minutes. But maybe that's your, uh, that's your situation. You're enslaved to yourself. The, the chains of selfishness, the second set of chains that I identified was the chains of unforgiveness. And last week, Rachel did a phenomenal job being candid about her own life. And I know many of us were impacted by that. But it's worth mentioning again because I believe many of us are still slodging around in our lives, enslaved to the chains of unforgiveness. Somebody said something, did something, hurt you, offended you, and you've just never forgiven them. Let me tell you, you are enslaved. You are not free. You've been made free. If you're a Christian, you know Jesus. He's forgiven you of your sins. You have fire insurance in heaven. But I promise you, you're not living in freedom. You're still enslaved. Did you realize that um, offense, being offended, is the heart and soul of unforgiveness? And Everybody in this room, Claremont, White River, watching online, wherever you are, including myself, has been offended. Everybody. Nobody's exempt from offense. We all get offended. I was offended when I was driving on Interstate 89 two days ago when two people cut me off. <laughs> I had to forgive them. I'm not enslaved to that, by the way. But we can all be offended, can't we? But here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the offense of a relationship. I'm talking about the offense of somebody who did something to you or took something from you. I'm talking about the offense of maybe something petty or maybe something big. We've all been offended. And offense can lead to unforgiveness. And unforgiveness, Jesus said, it's a promise, and it's impossible. Watch this in Luke 17. It's impossible that no offenses should come for all believers, like for all people. It's impossible. You will be offended. The question is, will you forgive? And many people just don't. They just manage their unforgiveness. It hurts you more than you know. Can I tell you that? This might be the chains and enslavement that I believe captures and captivates most Christians and never let go. We can hide it or we can ignore it or we try to forget it, but if you've never forgiven an offense, you're living in unforgiveness. Someone who's locked up with unforgiveness, someone who's chained up with unforgiveness, I have literally seen it begin the slow, grueling, long process of going from 
being offended, to unforgiveness, to bitterness, to mental illness. And I've seen it. Some of the most ill people I've ever known are because they haven't forgiven. Enslaved. I've seen Christians, people who've been set free, believe that he died on the cross, rose from the grave, he's coming back again. They read their Bible, but no way, you're not taking these off of me. I'm not forgiving her, and I'm not forgiving him. I'm not forgiving that. You're enslaved. You're not living in freedom. And those are some chains that need to be released. The third set of chains is the chains of rejection. The chains of rejection. Um, And and look, I'm going to be quite frank. I believe we live in a world right now that loves this one. If you've been rejected, then, well, you are a, uh, you're a victim, and you should celebrate that and hold on to that rejection and celebrate that rejection and, and make yourself vocal about that rejection and, and dress in regards to that. Are you guys tracking with me? We live in this. This is a world that celebrates us. By the way, this is from the pit of hell because they're chains. And I see it even in the church where people who've been rejected, maybe it was in a small way, maybe when you were younger. Uh, by the way, words have power, don't they? When somebody, when you were little, said something that maybe just hurt your heart a little bit and they rejected you, you will never be good at that. And it leads to a long road of enslavement. Rejection can do that. Words are powerful. Many of us are slodging around in the chains of negative words spoken over us. And we can take on the label of something someone has spoken and we live with it, and we're enslaved to it. Or, just like the others, the other chains, the key to release is surrender. You you can't hold on to it, my friends. The words that were spoken to you, maybe it was years ago, or maybe it was last week. We become enslaved to the rejection, and we let it be our identity Can I just tell you we need more words of life, don't we? We know we get those right here. And you get those in a good church where people are going to love you and be family to you. But those are the chains of rejection. The fourth set of chains are the chains of stinking thinking. And the reason I name them this, because I kind of name them, it's a little bit kind of fun. But when I get to them, you're going to be like, oh, dang. The chains of stinking thinking, the Bible, actually Jesus calls the chains of stinking thinking evil thoughts. Evil thoughts. Things that you have watched on your computer, right? Things that you looked at, evil thoughts. They, they go right to the, the eyes, to the mind. And the Bible calls them evil thoughts. And from a young age, we've all had these things projected before us. Maybe it's things you've heard, songs. Maybe it's an influencer that you follow on your social media. We've all had different things presented to us. We can run away from them and reject them or we just observe them and consume them and they become evil thoughts. And Jesus is real clear about those, that they're evil thoughts. Past, present, we've all had them. And what can happen is all those things that we've consumed and we've seen and heard and, and we've allowed into our lives become chains. We're enslaved to them. We can't get the pictures out of our mind. We can't get those thoughts out of our heart. And we become enslaved to them. It says in Mark chapter 7, Um, for from within, everybody take your thumb and do this, from within, from within, out of a person's heart, look, I'm going to stop there, because when you hear this, you're like, oh, Hallmark, Hallmark card, right? 
from a person's heart because we've been conditioned in this world to think that everything in the heart is good and floofy and unicorns, gummy bears, and Skittles falling from the sky. Oh, right? No, 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 no. Jesus says this. He says, no, from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts. No hallmark here, my friends. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things, all these vile things come where? From within. In you and in me. We've subjected ourselves to it and we've become enslaved to them. There are many of us who are walking around right now. You came in here today, you walked into the theater in Claremont, and you're ensnared and enslaved to evil thoughts. You try to push them off, you try to manage them for a few days or a couple months, but at the end of the day, there's no release from them until there's surrender. Freedom is what we should desire, living in freedom. But unfortunately, many Christians don't live in freedom. So there are very distinct restrictions. There are very distinct chains that have caused many of us to really not live in the freedom that God wants for us. We've been set free. Our sins are forgiven. We attend church occasionally. We're church people. You're here today, maybe every other week, but that doesn't mean you're living in freedom. That just means you're, you're free. You got, you got fire insurance. But you're wrapped up and tied into the chains of selfishness, unforgiveness, rejection, and stinking thinking. And of course, there are other chains and what I call like subversions of these chains. And many of us are just wrapped up and enslaved in them. And we are just paralyzed. And we are not living in freedom. Like the Galatians... You were slaves before you knew God, and now you're slaves once again. So how do we experience freedom? How do we experience freedom? Let's go back to Galatians. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. So Christ has truly set us free. We've been set free. And Paul, I love that he reminds the Galatians, you have been set free. You, your sin no longer, you're no longer going to have to face the judgment of God and the wrath of God because of unforgiven sin. Like he's forgiven you. But here's where it gets interesting. Watch what he says here. Now make sure that you what? Stay free. And don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. For them, it was religion, slavery to law. For you, it's the slavery of selfishness, the the slavery of unforgiveness, the slavery of rejection, the slavery of stinking thinking. I want you to look at that scripture, and he says, don't get tied up again into what? What is the what? What is the slavery that you're tied up in? You need to be honest about it. What is keeping you from living in freedom? What, is, what are the chains that are enslaving you right now? Let's jump to verse 7 and 8. Paul is continuing this theme. He's, he's, he's charging the Galatians. He's like, this is, you've, been, you've been set free. You've got to stay free. Hey, don't let these things hold you down. Don't let them tie you down. Verse 7, he says this. You were running the race so well. Who has held you back from following the truth? Watch this. It certainly isn't God. For he's the one who what? Called you to freedom. I want you to imagine that. He called you to freedom. Now, you've been set free, right? We've got covered this, and I want you to catch it. You've been set free, but you also need to stay free and watch us go to freedom. It's kind of like a place. But yet many Christians aren't living in the place of freedom. Matter of fact, if you jump down and look at verse 13, he says this. This is so good. Look at the person next to you say, this is really good. Verse 13, for you have been called to live where? In freedom. My brothers and sisters, don't Just use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. 
We have been called, Christian, to live in the place of freedom, in freedom. We've been set free. Our sins are forgiven. They've been bought with a price. He resurrected from the grave, conquered death and hell. We have victory everlasting, but yet as we live here now, we're still slodging around in the chains. And God's like, I I want you to live in freedom. I want you to go to that place. But in order to go to that place of living in freedom, it requires surrender. And that's what I want to show you right now. Three steps to live in freedom. I believe, listen, I believe this can change your life. This can change your life forever. But you've got to surrender. The first step, verse 16, let's look at it. So I say, let, this is Paul, he's saying it. Here's the solution. Here's how to live in freedom. Let the Holy Spirit, what? Guide your lives. Number one, invite the Holy Spirit to guide me. You've got to invite him to guide you. Surrender says, okay, I'm doing a poor job of guiding myself. I can't let go of this thing. I can't forgive. I'm so self-centered. I, I, you know, I'm allowing those words that 20 years ago that my dad said to me, haunt me all the time. You know what? I'm going to let you guide me here on, from here on, Holy Spirit. You live in me. By the way, Christian, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. When you said yes to Jesus, when you were rescued, the Bible says that he came in and lived inside of you, his spirit did, and he sealed you. He will not leave you, he will not forsake you, but you have to let him guide you. Now, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I promise you, this is something that will change your life when the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. And if you're like, I want to know more about this Holy Spirit, sign up for Roots. It's happening on Sunday. You don't want to miss it. And if you're like, I can't go this week, we'll go next week, right? Or go next time. There are always going to be Roots and you learn about the Holy Spirit. But Christian, listen to me. You've got to let the Holy Spirit guide you. If you're going to live in freedom, you've got to let him guide you. It includes allowing him to show you the areas of your life that need to be surrendered further. It's incredibly vulnerable when you say, I'm going to let you guide me, Spirit. It's hands off, man. But yet, I think many of us were kind of like, eh, I just kind of want one hand on the wheel. <laughs> I'll let you guide a little bit, but I don't want to go that way. Listen to me. Surrender says it's not me, it's he. And Holy Spirit, you live in me and you're going to guide me. Paul says it very clearly Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Then you won't be controlled by the chains that have enslaved you. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. So powerful. And I got to tell you, this is so hard. It requires vulnerability on your part to be able to say, okay, I'm going to let you guide me. And that includes pointing out things and convicting me of the things in my life that need to be corrected or guided by you. Let me ask you this. Is there a sacred part of your life that you're like, well, God's not going to get that one? That's, you can't surrender. Until you, until you surrender, you can't allow the Holy Spirit to guide you until you surrender. And then you're like, okay, he can guide me in that area and that area and that area. Maybe you, all the chains that we talked about, maybe you're like, man, I am absolutely enslaved. I am like a, I'm a mummy of chains in my life. I've been set free eternally, but man, I am not living in freedom. Well, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. That's hard. But that's a key step to living in freedom and not just having fire insurance from hell. Galatians chapter 5, Paul continues on, verse 24. Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, I want you to hear this. This is the the truth that we've been set free. We're not living in freedom, but we've been set free. And because we've been set free, we should desire to live in freedom. Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Here's the bottom line. 
For you and me, if we're going to live in freedom, it's taking the truth that we have been set free and it's applying it to say, I want to live in freedom and I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit because he's done for me what I cannot do for myself. He's made me right. I have been set free from everlasting punishment because of my sin. Now, Holy Spirit, change me. If we're going to live in freedom, we've got to invite the Holy Spirit to say, change me. It's guide me but it's also changed me. And for many people, you're like, nah, I don't really want change. I'm good. Again, not that area. Well, guess what? You're gonna live in chains the rest of your life. You're gonna be enslaved. And I tell you, that's not God's plan for you. He wants you to live in freedom, in the place of freedom. In order to do that, you've gotta invite the Holy Spirit to to change you. Guide me and change me. Give me the right desires. And that's what surrender says. Change me. Okay. You want me to change that area of my life? Game on. Let's go. Surrender says, I want you to change me. And I want to live in freedom. Guide me. Change me. Every part of my life. Nothing sacred. I'm completely naked before you, Holy Spirit. And I'm going to allow you to change me. If you're really going to live in freedom, it requires that. And if you and me are going to live in freedom, no longer allow the chains to bind us and enslave us, number three, verse 25, it says this, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading, everybody say leading, and here it is, in every, in every part of our lives. And what that's saying, this, the key word is in every part. And for you and me, if we are going to li- live released of these and live in freedom, this is so important. You've got to invite the Holy Spirit to fill you. You're saying, Holy Spirit, fill me. It's an invitation, not just of guidance, it's not just an invitation, invitation of, okay, Holy Spirit, I, I'm going to let you change me, but it's okay, you fill me. You live in me, but I want you to fill me. And this is so important to the discipline of a Christian. And I've shared this before, and I'm going to share it again, and I'll share it again. You have to invite him to fill you on a daily basis. It's a constant When you say fill me, you're saying it ain't enough. I need more of you. You live in me, Holy Spirit. Christian, remember, he lives there. God's spirit has been placed in you. But it's just like when I drive my car, right? The tank goes empty pretty quickly. Isn't that crazy how fast the tank gets empty? And it's no different for you and me. The spirit's there, but the surrender goes quickly. The filling goes quickly. And if you and me are going to be free of these. We have got to ask and invite the Holy Spirit to fill me. Remember, he lives in you. One of the best things somebody told me was, Chris, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. And he will not force fill you. He wants you to surrender that. Fill me up. I am desperate. I am hopeless. I need you. You live in me, Spirit. Fill me head to toe. Some of the greatest, most impacting men and women of God were filled with the Spirit. It was a discipline. It was part of their life. And if you and me are going to live in freedom, we have to do it filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. The chains will ruin your life. Instead, what? Be filled with the Spirit. Filled means to diffuse throughout one's soul. And when you're inviting the Holy Spirit to fill you, you're like, diffuse throughout all of my being. I'm in surrender to you. And my friends, if we're going to live in freedom, we've got to be a people who are inviting the Holy Spirit to change us, to fill us, and to guide us. And I promise you, when you do this, this will begin a new season of living in freedom. 
And I promise you that's the place where God wants you to be. You see, the chains of selfishness, unforgiveness, rejection, and stinking thinking, they shackle us. They immobilize us. And they can virtually make us ineffective as Christians. But when we surrender to the Holy Spirit, that's when we begin to live in freedom. And I believe we have a next step to take. I believe many, and if not everybody, has a next step to take. And I want to invite you to consider that. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity we have to come here and worship you and celebrate you. We get to come here and be challenged by your word. Thank you for Galatians. Thank you for Paul and his inspired pen uh, to write this letter to Christians just like us 2,000 years ago. Um, I ask you, Lord, that you would help us to lean into what you want us to do, what next step you have for us. God, I believe you have something for all of us, and I ask that you would reveal that. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And I believe that there are some people in this room right now and online who have a first step to take. And the first step is, is, a, is the most important step, I believe. I talked about this quite often today, and that was the fact that you've been set free. Christians, people who have a relationship with God through Jesus, have been set free. What does that mean, Chris? I'm glad you asked. Here's what it means. It means a, a person recognizes that they have a serious problem. And the serious problem is on the inside. It's these things. It's the stinking thinking. It's the selfishness. It's all those things. Those are something called sin nature. We all have it, and it never disappears or goes away. But in order for us to be set free, in order for us to experience rescue from God through his son, Jesus Christ, it requires us to be honest about our sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of God and his glory. Everybody, including me, we've all lied, we've all cheated, we've stolen, we've slept around, we've looked at things we shouldn't look at. I mean, I could go on all day. We're all sinners, for all have sinned and fallen short of God and his glory. God is holy and God is perfect, and you and me are not. And because of that sin and God's perfection, there's this broken relationship that happens. And maybe you're here today, you're watching online, you're like, I feel that. I, I feel like a, a brokenness between me and God. I feel far from God. I don't know God. I, I, it's like so, almost to the point where I don't even know if I believe because it's just so, so such a chasm. Well, that's what sin does. But sin doesn't just cause a broken relationship between us and God. Here's, here's the heaviness of sin. The heaviness of sin actually causes a bigger problem than just a broken relationship with God. The scripture says this, for the wages of sin is death. That means this, the consequence of sin isn't only a broken relationship, but it also causes you and me to one day die. 10 out of 10 people will die and it's a result of our sin nature. It's there, you will die, I will die, and we're all infected with the sin nature and it will cause us to die. But here's where it gets heavy and uncomfortable. is that that sin that causes a broken relationship, that causes you and me to die, also has an impact eternally. You see, the Bible says that everybody has eternity drawn upon their hearts, you and me. You know that this life is temporary and there will be something beyond this life. And according to scripture and according to Jesus Christ himself, if you and me were to die without our sins removed, without our sins forgiven by God, you and me would spend eternity when we die in a literal place called hell. That's a problem. I hope you feel the weight of this. You mean to tell me, Chris, that I'm a sinner, I'm going to die one day, and if I die without my sins forgiven by God, I will spend eternity in hell? Yes. And that's a huge problem. But I'm here today to tell you that there's good news. And the good news is God loves you. He loves you. The Bible says this, for God so loved the world. 
He loves you and me so much. Here's how much. God so loved the world that he gave. (laughs) He said, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to do something about the sin and hell problem because I love people. So God loved you so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to come and live a sinless, perfect life. Jesus Christ, listen to me, is the solution to our sin problem. Jesus lived for 33 years, never did a wrong thing, never told a lie. Why? So that he could go to a Roman cross and die in your place, in my place. He paid the price that you could never pay and I could never pay. And Jesus died on the cross. He was buried. Three days later, Jesus conquered death and hell so that you and me don't have to face it. Jesus Christ is the solution to our sin problem. And the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on him and you will be rescued from the consequence of sin and you will be set free and have hope and have peace and have joy. But you've got to believe. So my question for you is this, have you been set free? I'm not asking if you're living in freedom. We'll get there. Have you been set free? Has Jesus set you free from the consequence of sin? Has Jesus set you free from everlasting life, separated from God in a literal place called hell? If you're here today, you're watching online, and you have not asked Jesus to be your rescuer, then I want to give you the opportunity right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, private moment. Please respect the room. Don't get up. If you're sitting in your living room, just sit with me. Stay with me. If you want to say yes to Jesus today, if you want to be set free today, I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, I'm going to invite you to quietly raise your hand, okay? One, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be rescued. The Bible says believe and you'll be rescued too. Today is the day You can believe today. You don't have to put it off anymore. You don't have to manage it anymore. Like today is the day that you can believe. And if that's you, three, raise your hand right where you are. If you're online, raise your hand. Wherever you are, just raise your hand. Chris, I want to be rescued today. I I want my sins forgiven. I want this relationship that you speak of. If you have your hand up, you're online, I want you to know I'm so proud of you. So here's what I want to do. You have your hand up. You're like, Chris, I want to believe today. Now what? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to text the words, respond now to the number 94,000. Just text those words, respond now to 94,000. And we will get right in touch with you and we'll help you better understand what it is to be rescued, to be set free and experience this unbelievable relationship with Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that this message has encouraged you and challenged you to grow in your walk with God. And if you want to stay up to date on new messages every week, be sure to subscribe to our channel to be notified anytime we put up a new video. Here at Riverbank, we are on a rescue mission to reach people with the message of Jesus. And if you would like to partner with us, you can go to riverbankchurch.com forward slash give or click on the giving link in the description. We love you and we're praying for you. We'll see you next week.